Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm happy to introduce Alfredo Gischalt this afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, I feel blinded by the lights a little bit. Um, so ArtSpeak is an interdisciplinary program presented by the Departments of Fine Arts and History of Art and includes a series of lectures and activities on the theme of the presence of art history in the mind of the artist. We have invited contemporary artists to talk about their work and the impact of art history on their current studio practice. Um, other Art Speak activities this year include studio visits to artist studios, a panel discussion, and a collaborative project among fine arts majors in art history and museum professions majors culminating in an exhibition in the FIT library, which should be this spring. Um, the Art Speak Committee would like to thank Sass Brown, Acting Associate Dean of the School of Art and Design, and Patrick Nicely, Dean of the School of Liberal Arts, for their generous support and commitment to this program, and the Student Faculty Corporation for making this event possible. We thank our chairs, Joel Waring from Fine Arts, David Drogan from History of Art, and Rachel Baum, Associate Chair of Art History and Museum Professions, for their support as well. Um, we also thank Library Director N.J. Bradding and the library staff for hosting the student exhibition next semester. Um, our speaker today is Alfredo Gischalt. And um, I'd just tell you a little bit about Alfredo's background. He attended Acad Ac Academia de San Carlos in Mexico City and received his MFA from Boston University. He was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Dataless Dattel Foundation Fellowship. Um, Alfredo has had recent solo exhibitions at Q Art Foundation in New York City, the University of Maine Museum of Art, Deborah Colton Gallery in Houston, and the Recinto Project Me Room in Mexico City. He currently teaches at Brandeis University and lives and works in Boston, and I've had the pleasure of visiting his studio there, which was amazing, and I feel so happy to be able to see him talk about his work today. So, um, Following his talk today, I just want to let everybody know that there's going to be Q, questions and answers, Q&A, and &A, in room 627. Everyone's invited to come, so please join us. And please join me in welcoming Alfredo Gischalt. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, everybody who made it out here. Um, when Stephanie invited me to come and talk about my paintings, you know, as part of the lecture series, um, the theme of it being art history, uh, it's something that, you know, from the very beginning when I started painting, um, you know, I got to painting through the painters of the past. Um, so I th the first thing that came to my mind, a friend of mine gave me, you know, a handwritten quote uh, from John Constable. That's a small painting by John Constable. And I'm going to share the quote with you because in many ways it kind of, um, it reminds me of why I started to, it, it reminds me of what I want my paintings to be and to be in, the people that I want to be in conversation with. So this is from a letter to a friend, John Dunthrone, um, and the quote goes as follows. There is room enough for a natural painter. The great vice of the present day is bravura, an attempt to do something beyond the truth. In endeavoring to do something better than well, they do what in reality is good for nothing. Fashion always had and will have its day, but truth in all things only will last and can only have just claims on pos prosperity. Um, posterity not prosperity. Uh, so, you know, this little handwritten note, I have it, you know, right by my door, and um, it reminds me that painting always, when it succeeds, it reveals a certain kind of truth. And the way that I arranged my presentation today was, you know, in trying to tell you a little bit about my biography uh, at the same time that I introduce some of my, you know, heroes in the studio and some of the, you know, painters that I really want to emulate and, and, and um, use as a kind of um, a guide for the kind of, you know, truth that could be revealed and also a kind of ambition. So, 
A little bit about myself. I was born and raised in Mexico. Um, I was there until I was 16 and I went to high school in Miami. Um, I'm gonna skip a lot and I'm also gonna, you know, in terms of my biography, um, as a young man in high school, I had an affinity for art, but I didn't really think of myself as an artist. Uh, you know, my family's family of engineers, and um, I always thought I was going to be an engineer. And until I got to the community college and I received a humanities scholarship that um, gave me the opportunity to take studio courses. And for two years in Miami, I was taking studio courses. and. Um, there was something there, you know, I started the community college with two biomedical engineering classes, two studio courses, two studio classes, and by the end of the third week I had dropped the two engineering classes um, and just focused on studio. Um, at the end of those two years, before I could get my associate's degree, because I was missing those two original engineering courses, um, I decided to go to Spain. Um, my cousin was living there and uh, he had an apartment in Madrid and he stopped by Miami and said if you want to come over um, come visit. So these paintings here were the first ones that um, I encountered as a young artist and you know the first two years at the community college I was making a lot of things that kind of looked like art. Uh, a lot of assignments and you know, a lot of non-representational stuff and a lot of kind of things that seem like more like curiosities than anything. Um, but, you know, at 19 years old, I moved to Spain to stay with my cousin and I was no longer a student. Uh, I had dropped out of community college and um, I had no job. I had a little bit of money to last for about six months. And these were the paintings um, you know, I would go to the museum every day and just spend some time with them. It was a very affordable thing to do. Oh, I didn't name the first one. This is the painting by Velázquez. It's called Las Meninas. Uh, and, you know, they were magnificent. They're bigger than life size. And, you know, after two years of being an art student, uh, I had the opportunity to just be around these things. And, and I remember one day just leaving the museum and, and, and say to myself, you know, this is something, I want to do this. Uh, so very early on, I'm going to just briefly show you just a bunch of images from that time um, and from painters that I really kind of admired. This is another Goya painting. The last one was The Royal Family by Goya. Um, and at the time, I didn't know what it was about these paintings, but I did find a kind of dialogue between all of them. There was a, something about the sort of the Spanish sensibility that drew me in. I, I have a tendency to be somewhat of a pessimist uh, at times, you know, very optimistic other times, but I, but these paintings sort of spoke of what I consider to be big subjects, you know, sometimes using religion, you know, here is Jesus being taken. Uh, I grew up Catholic and some of the you know, some of these images seem familiar. I knew them from literature. Um, you know, and they had to do with the sacrifice of one for others, you know, in a more human way, not just to, to sort of the, the religious part of it. Um, and I thought they were just visually extraordinary. And, um, you know, I got to spend about eight months in Spain with, with my cousin and, um, I had a sketchbook. I didn't do anything that looked or resembled this. Um, you know, I was trying to be some much more of a contemporary artist, kind of gathering stuff and gluing things on my sketchbook. Um, but years later, these were the images that that when that kept coming back to me in the studio, um, and and I developed a certain kind of sensibility or, you know, an identity as a painter through these, you know, kind of Spanish uh, 1500s to 1600s painters. Um, this last two are paintings by El Greco. And one of the wonderful things that I found, this is a painting by El Greco that's at the Toledo Cathedral. Um, and he was a very enigmatic guy, and 
you know, was from Greece and found himself in Toledo, which was a great place to make paintings, but it was also kind of an invisible place. Um, painters sought him out, and, you know, when I saw this little Goya painting that also is at the Toledo Cathedral, I realized that these, the painters have conversations with one another, that, that you know, we can't do it alone. Uh, and, you know, in addressing art history, the, the first thing that came to my mind was that, you know, I don't, I don't think of it as art history in many ways, um, because it's not this linear thing that I get to look back upon. Um, you know, standing in front of all of these wonderful images and terrific paintings that, that really are imbued with, with so much more than just the depiction of something. Um, you know, they don't seem from the past, they live in the present. Um, so in trying to speak about the relationship of art history, you know, to, in my studio, it's almost like I don't see it as a historical thing. Uh, you know, I just see paintings in front of me and I've seen a lot of paintings where the painter is not next to me. Um, the painter may be living or they may not, um, but the paintings are, you know, as alive in one instance as the other. So, you know, this is El Greco in the middle of the 1500s. The next one that I'll show you is a painting by Cezanne that was done in 1900. And when I'm in front of them, and I normally carry my sketchbook, uh, just to kind of get a little bit of time with them and, 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 and draw to, to internalize some of the things. When that happens, you know, they're not, they're, they're you know, they're contemporary or they're contemporaneous to me. Um, so I guess I put together a bunch of images, like I said, of the people that really sort of populate my mind and my studio in this non-linear way. And I do want to share that it is, you know, even the slideshow seems like this, you know, image after image after image. When I walk into my studio, it's not like that. It's a real mess, you know, where, where all of these images that, that I've responded to, that I share some affinities with, that I, that my ambition is to sort of engage with them, um, they're all there simultaneously. And um, I'll speak specifically about some of these new, you know, there's a big jump between the El Greco and the Cezanne. Uh, another one of the most, um, important moments of my painting life, and Nick is here, was at graduate school at BU. Um, I went to BU after graduating from the academy in Mexico. Um, and, and just to share a little bit of what brought me to BU, um, the academy in Mexico was really, it was wonderful training, uh, but it, it, you know, it came with, with a real sort of cultural baggage, I mean, um, politics and the arts in Mexico are very, very much linked together. And while I was at the academy, the Zapatista revolution had started down in Chiapas. And we were all, you know, sort of engaged with that cause until it started taking over sort of the life of the academy. And um, one day I came in and students had wanted to print posters uh, to support the Zapatista movement down in Chiapas, and they were not allowed. And they decided to burn the print shop down. So one morning I came in and, and, and it was all burnt down. We were denied access. And coincidentally, I had seen some, um, I had seen a photograph of a John Walker painting uh, who at the time was teaching at BU and the day that I walked into the academy, having seen that, those paintings by John Walker, I decided to leave. Uh, and I tried to get into Yale and I was not accepted. And um, the following year, my wife was hired at, Boston, at a school uh, in Boston, she's in education. And um, I realized that John was teaching at BU. So I applied and um, that's when I met Nick. We were studio neighbors the first year. And I guess the first week, I came in with a really kind of, you know, some arrogance, I mean, well, no, 
a lot of arrogance, some, um, you know, a lot of self, a big ego about, um, I guess, about my painting, and um, a real kind of set in my ways. And my paintings were really dark. They spoke of the big subjects that I've always wanted to address. And um, I think my first week, I, I demonized French painting at a bar, and uh, one of my peers, ratted me out. Um, I said some bad things about Matisse. And, um, you know, somebody else was buying the pictures of beer and then I got a little carried away. Well, the next morning I came into my studio and I, had, I, and I found a big pile of Matisse books at my door. Uh, and I had no idea what had happened and I then realized that somebody had told, all the, all the books came from John Walker's studio, who, you know, at the time was, a really sort of um, important figure because I really trusted him with just teaching me how to paint. Um, so I started to, you know, I had, I guess I had, I had to confront, my paintings look very different than, 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 you know, a lot of the sensibilities of French painting. Um, I'm going to show you a few Matisse paintings because ever since that day, he's been incredibly present in my studio. Um, This one is here at MoMA. I can get, you know, you guys should all go see it. Alongside that one. That's a Picasso painting, the Demoiselle d'Avignon. And, you know, there was something about narrative figure painting that always interested me. And um, anyway, BU was, was, was really mind blowing. I started to paint really outside of my sensibilities and uh, it was somewhat very confusing. So I spent two years just fumbling around and, you know, Nick remembers this, just making paintings that I didn't even recognize. Um, and with all of these paintings in the back of my mind, uh, there was a wonderful moment to show here at PS1 when uh, MoMA closed for renovations that they brought Matisse and Picasso together. And I remember seeing that exhibition and that wall re just really I don't know, confused me at the same time, motivated me to try to deal with, you know, uh, the tension between, you know, what I consider abstraction and representation and how to put those two things together. Um, I guess I'm taking too long just showing you images. But these are the people that I bring to the studio. This is a series of paintings by Brock uh, that one of the things that I did while I was at BU, I started painting outside, which I had never done. And painting outside was both incredibly challenging, um, but really informative. Um, I had not painted perceptually very much up to that point. And, you know, kind of like baseball terminology, the landscape keeps you honest. Uh, it kept me honest for a long time, and I came back and I did paintings of my studio perceptually. And these paintings by Brock were very, very important um, at the time because they had a, I felt that I had an affinity for them. Um, you know, the palette, the mood, the color, um, pictorial space, and all of those kinds of things that I had really ignored for a really long time. I'm gonna show you a couple of paintings by John Walker because he really was, um, very important. I mean, he, his teaching was incredibly challenging. I consider myself very fortunate to have a group of painter friends while I was there that were, you know, we were totally dedicated and, and we had a strong belief that we could make a difference from this little, you know, third floor building in, in Commonwealth Avenue, that what we were doing, you know, if we supported each other, it mattered. So this is one of the paintings by John that I saw in Mexico, and which is kind of what led me to leave Mexico and come back to, you know, to the United States and Yale and then Boston. Um, this is one recent one by him, a uh, show here at Alexander not too long ago. And... Um, I guess if I could summarize some of, you know, I, in reading for this talk, uh, I found this wonderful Goya quote that he says that he has three teachers. Uh, I said, oh, I'm gonna steal that because I, I feel like I have the same thing. And um, 
I feel like, you know, that I also have three teachers. Uh, one and, you know, most importantly, I think, is nature. The other one would be Goya, and I think the third one will be John, John Walker. Uh, from that place, I've been painting for a while now. Um, one of the things that I did right after graduate school was I got a, an internship um, to work at the Guggenheim Museum in Venice, and um, I lived in Venice for eight months. Um, I was very confused after graduate school, and um, I wanted to get out and sort it out. Um, I was painting in ways, like I told you, I'd, I didn't recognize. And I was gonna bring images of that, but I tried scanning my slides and it just didn't work out, and I apologize for that. But, um, but I was working at the Guggenheim, drawing from Tintoretto paintings like this one, and I requested that every day I be a guard at the abstract expressionist room, uh, and I would draw from these. And from these two were the ones that I kept coming back to. I had a little sketchbook that I carried with me. I didn't have a studio or anything. And I took a picture, a couple of pictures of my sketchbook just to show you guys. I filled sketchbooks while I was there, uh, just sort of visiting places. And one of the things that I realized is that you know, I was trying to come to terms with the, the syntax of my painting, how to paint, what to paint about. I always felt that, that, you know, the original paintings that I showed you, naturalistic, representational, figurative paintings, were, were the ones that, that I really thought communicated, you know, and spoke about very big subjects. But, you know, Pollock and de Kooning and the way that they moved material around, and to a certain extent, to a big extent, uh, John Walker also, you know, was something about that kind of, you know, non-representational painting that intrigued me. And going back and forth between Tintoretto and Pollock, at some point, uh, and I also stumble upon Proust. Uh, Proust lived in Venice, wonderful writer, um, and, in his book, Remembrance of Time's Loss, he talks about simultaneity in Venice, where you walk around the streets of Venice and it feels timeless. You know, you go to a restaurant and you see the drapery uh, of the restaurant and you're just having a meal and you can go into one of the churches, whichever one it is, and see that same drapery painted on a Carpaccio painting. And it surprised them, it confused them. And, you know, reading that and experiencing Venice, it confused me as well. So I spent a year away, you know, really kind of, again, trying, for the first time somebody had describe very accurately that feeling that all painting is living in the present tense. And um, then I came back and I was at BU teaching for three years in a very private studio, I mean public studio. I was part of the graduate school and um, you know, I was there three years, real visible. Um, this is a photograph of my studio right after I left BU teaching. So this is around 2004. Um, the danger of showing you all of those wonderful paintings is that when I introduce mine is an incredibly humbling experience. You know, um, I just notice all of the, how would you say? <laughs> you know, how bad they are uh, in relation to those. Um, but uh, I also, you know, I, I wanted to show you also how I work. Um, this studio was outside of Boston. Um, I was now teaching at Brandeis University and my studio was in Concord, Massachusetts in this beautiful old factory building. Um, I had a lot of space for really cheap. And for the first time I had a private studio in many, many years. And one of the things that I decided to do was to try to go back to that initial moment when I really fell in love with painting. Um, and, you know, this is the other view of the studio. I think, Joel, you and I, did an exhibition together right around this time. So you, you came to this studio, right? Uh, huh? You did, yes. Uh, and um, 
You know, also, it, it, it shows you a little bit of how I work. I'm a terrible thinker when it comes to painting, and I realize that even just going from my... I don't know how to look at a painting of mine and, and you know, sort of verbalize to myself or even, even analyze it. So what I need to do is give myself options. So, for example, if I say, what would that look like as a green and yellow painting? Instead of imagining it and changing it, I paint another one. And can you guys see the little arrow when I do that? And if I don't have big canvases, I make drawings. So I think visually. I always just generate work to, to work ideas out. And in this studio, um, again, kind of going back to my, you know, when nobody was looking, I said, you know, I'm going to do paintings that I... That, that I can recognize and that I can feel a certain kind of affinity from that original point uh, of contact with it. And these, this painting came to mind. You know, I skipped Mexico and I just briefly mentioned it as, as the place that I grew up. But, but it, is, it is the place where I paint from. Uh, you know, my mother and dad were both working uh, a lot. You know, the Mexican typical d uh, day of work in Mexico is from 7 in the morning to 9 at night. Um, so my brothers and I were raised by two um, native Mexicans, you know, Indian Mexicans, that, you know, looked very different than we did. My grandfather is from Norway, and, you know, I'm a little taller than most, and a little, um, I look more European, but, but, you know, we were mingling in a wonderful community where there were no distinctions between anything. And that was important to me. Also, the sensibility of Mexico. There's a kind of surrealism. If you guys had a chance to visit, there's a kind of multiple realities, the color, the hospitality. Uh, yeah. It's a very, it's, it's, it's a, I paint from that place, uh, you know, that human place. And um, we rented a house. I went to visit my dad and we rented a house outside a little town. Well, my dad rented a house outside Mexico City in a small town called Tepoztlan. And life felt like this painting. Uh, so it all sort of came together and I decided to make a bunch of paintings. And here we are, this is my first one. And this is very small painting. To, so to see it, you know, projected mural size is quite a shocking experience. Um, you know, this is about, you know, 10 by 12 inches. And, you know, they're just groupings of figures, kind of like dances or, you know, processions. And I was trying to paint myself into that history of narrative figure painting. Um, you know, and trying to put everything in there. I'm going to move very, very quickly and talk basically over these images, not specifically about them. Uh, but you can sense that there's some recognizable things in them. Sometimes you, pick, you can pick out figures, you know, in this sort of field of paint. Um, and I made a lot of these. You know, they were my first kind of... Uh, point of entry when nobody was looking, um, you know, to paint things that, that, you know, during all those years where I was letting a lot of things into my painting um, got very confusing. So, I don't know if you guys have any questions or anything or comments while I'm doing this, just please feel free to interrupt me. So, you know, now that I've given you um, a little bit of, I'm gonna, you know, from now on it's good, going to be mostly images, you know, my painting. You know, and they could be very, very different from one another. I mean, one of the things that, that I never felt pressured to, to do was to have a kind of, I don't, you know, how you, continuity of voice. I always felt, you know, Picasso's also a very, very big influence and uh, later de Kooning. Um, you know, the kind of curiosity that those painters have and the allowance that they can just look very different. So, you know, I would have that painting that has a very different sort of pictorial syntax or, or, or even language to that one, and they'd be next to each other. And um, I was trying to, you know, if one painting went one way, I followed it, and if another one went the other way, I also did that. Um, so, again, these paintings, um, 
are trying to tell a kind of story. You know, I did go to that town often. The town is Tepoztlan, and it's you know is in the town of Morelos. And the, More the people from Morelos are you know uh, somewhat hot-headed, you know, with bad temper sometimes. And there are a lot of parties. There's a, there's a lot of there's different neighborhoods and. Each neighborhood celebrates its saint uh, once every two months. So, you know, six neighborhoods, you know, eight weeks. So there's always a party every week and everybody's invited. So gatherings look like this. A lot of people bring their animals to be blessed to the church and there's music, there's dance. And in one instance that I was there, you know, somebody had a little bit too much to drink and, and, you know, looked at somebody else's significant other in a wrong way and what seemed a very, very festive thing turned completely the opposite way. And I wanted to make, I want this painting, I wanted to make it about that particular experience. Uh, so here you see a lot of people carrying their animals and there's animals present, but it's in this sort of suspended state uh, where, you know, People can go home, or it could get very vicious. Um, and I started to sort of now deal with other, you know, bring in other things. And um, these two Picassos were very quickly what I gravitated towards. But I don't know, over the last few years, you know, here, New York has been a terrific place to see Matisse. There's been a, a lot of interest in Matisse. And, you know, since those first days of graduate school, he's been my, you know, somebody that I, that I, that I really have worked hard to understand. Um, and this painting, it, you know, I, I, I don't even know what it is. It's called Bathers Feeding a Turtle. Um, and, you know, it's just so, the, the Matisse paintings that I love are the ones that are so unprecedented, so enigmatic, that, that but so real. Uh, the expression of the figure in the center is both, you know, terrifying, and who would feed a turtle naked by the river? You know, just, when I try to think about it, but it just makes for this very, very beautiful human pictorial thing. Um, so I decided to confront it, and I made a lot of paintings really kind of using that structure. And these are some of the first attempts that combine the three, those two Picassos and the Matisse. And I'm gonna go really quickly because it's, I don't wanna run out of time. I do wanna to get to some of the, for, I, I have so, editing is not my strength. Um, these are small, the ones that you just saw are small paintings. I made a large one. Um, so on this one wall, I had sort of like, I'm dealing with Matisse kind of paintings. I did two of them, um, trying to think about, you know, other things. Um, in the time that I was preparing all of these uh, canvases, I, started, I taught printmaking for a while at Brandeis. These are some Goya prints. And again, I'm gonna run uh, through them quickly. I've been making prints for a very long time. Um, and during this time, I started a series of um, etchings that were based on drawings like this, which are drawings of my studio. That's like my flipped over trash can in the middle. You know, I do have a little bit, a bunch of knickknacks and curiosities, um, stretcher bars on one side. And I did, um, Matt was talking about Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin is a very dear friend. She's a printmaker, terrific print. You know, she, she's a Pratt now. Um, and I worked with her to make a suite of prints, and I'll show you them very quickly. This is simultaneous to those, uh, to that Matisse, you know, sort of referential painting. And again, There's 12 etchings, and right around the same time, the de Kooning exhibition happened here in New York. And one of the most incredible things about that exhibition was how much de Kooning, to me, allowed himself to really just 
to, to follow his pictorial curiosity, you know, even at the expense of familiarity. You know, you can see him paint really kind of without compromise, looking for, you know, he looks like this in 1939 or 1945, and then two years later he looks like that. That surprised me. Uh, and I wanted to give myself the opportunity to do that. So the first kind of obvious attempt in doing so was to try to emulate de Kooning. And I made a bunch of paintings like this. You know, sort of, these are 18 by 24. And I, do, I still don't know. One of the things that I wanted to do was to really compress pictorial space, to make it really, really shallow. Um, and I'm going to bring in another one of my dear friends. That's Matisse doing cutouts because I had an opportunity. Like I said, seeing Matisse recently here, in, especially here in New York, you've gotten a lot to see a lot of it. This blew me away. I just did not understand how it was so beautifully constructed, incredibly put together. It kind of, this is memory of Oceania for from 1953. This is painted at the same time as that de Kooning woman picture. And, um, you know, they're made at the same time. And, and there are two, two paintings that, that I really wanted to kind of deal with. So at the same time that I was doing that Matisse painting. So like I was saying, it's a real mess. I mean, it is not clear. I started making these big drawings. These drawings are about six foot high by seven foot wide, and they're cut out paper. And one of the things that I wanted to do with these was really just compress pictorial space, simplify them, remove some of the nameable things, but without sacrificing content. Um, and I was, I was in a very, I was confused at this time. I didn't know, you know, I think in, in a kind of singular way, they all seemed okay, but going from seeing one wall to seeing the other, it didn't, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, these are some of the drawings. And at, this was about maybe four years ago. 2012, um, I had a show very close by at Q in 2014, and I needed to get some paintings done. And, you know, these are, it took me a while to get going and get past that one that I showed you, you know, really referencing Matisse. I didn't want to repeat myself. I didn't want to, um, you know, look familiar in the studio. And, um, this is when another aspect of kind of art history comes in. Um, I've been reading for a long time and poetry has always been very important. Um, one of my favorite books is Canto General by Pablo Neruda, which narrates the history of the Americas, you know, sort of from Mexico down. Uh, and it goes from pre-Columbian times, from the very beginning, you know, uh, of, of inhabiting that part of the world to the United Fruit Company. Uh, in, um, you know, and US intervention and, you know, politics and, and oppression and all that kind of thing. I use that text uh, to, to generate some of the imagery. So these paintings come after that. So the, the exhibition here was called Canto General in reference to that book. And so what I did is I took certain poems uh, from that book. It's written in that kind of like the, um, you know, epic poet, um, epic poem, which is, you know, small poems that make a bigger narrative. So each one of these paintings sort of deals with one poem from the book. Um, these are big again. These are six and a half foot by seven and a half. And I may run out of time. Um, I'll go very quickly. You know, one of the things that I really wanted to, to, to explore with some of these was a kind of introduction of color that, um, that at times I seem to have avoided. Um, again, these started to be about accumulation. You know, my son, who at this time was about nine, uh, 
he came over to the studio one day and he said, Dad, why are you, guys, why are you always painting the dump? Uh, and I thought it was a terrific way of describing my paintings because it, I do paint that, you know. These paintings seem to be populated by the accumulation of things that I'm not looking. You know, we all have that little corner of a room where things pile up. Uh, and make no sense, and there's a bag of something, you know, a bag of Doritos and maybe spare tubes for the bicycle or something. You know, that, that's the kind of imagination that's built into the poem by Pablo Neruda, kind of magic realism that I used to hinge these paintings on. Uh, some get somewhat symbolic, you know, on the right-hand side of this one, it's a real allusion to the three crosses. Um, some allude to religion uh, in the poem. So, I know that we have to be very strict with time. <laughs> huh? Interest me? Of course. Gustin taught at BU, you know, and I think from going very, very quickly, I skipped a quote by Gustin that I was gonna share with you guys. Um, but yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, it's um, a lot of, but I don't think about him as much as I do, you know, it directly. You know, I've been reading his writings. There was a beautiful book just published uh, recently. I love the way he speaks about painting. Every time I see one, I feel like I want to, I want to be the one to have made it. Uh, yeah, but. I guess it's in there, maybe um, one of the quotes that I was gonna share, and it was right after I showed you everything, Gustin had a lecture at BU, not when I was there, but uh, before, that he described going into his studio with you know, the, the weight of every painter and the presence of every painter, and that you know, if he says, you know, I come into my studio and I have everybody on my shoulders, and if things are going well in the studio, he was a night painter and sometimes drank heavily during painting sessions. Um, but, you know, he says if things are going well, uh, people start leaving. And if things are going really well, Piero may leave. Uh, if things are going really, really well, you know, Goya may leave. Um, when they're extremely well, uh, Rembrandt leaves. And he says, but I've never made a painting until I leave. Um, I think it's a terrific way of describing, you know, the magic that could happen. Sometimes, I've experienced it a couple of times, very seldomly, where you feel like you're no longer there and something has taken over. Um, it's very difficult, I can't replicate it. I sometimes stumble upon it. So I've continued to do the same thing. Make these little paintings, make these big drawings and allow them to be what they are. I haven't wanted to, you know, oh, I should make more this, you know, make it resemble that or, or vice versa. I've allowed them to sort of breathe in front of each other. Um, or exist next to one another. These are small again. This is 2014. These two paintings are from a, Joel, this is from a series of, you know, the kind of, I set up my easel in the middle of the studio and then I was looking both ways. I made about 15 paintings that really wanted to do what I just described I wasn't doing. Uh, so in these, I really would, you know, looked at the syntax and what the paintings looked like and what the drawings, you know, their space, their, you know, the, in terms of formal elements and, you know, just, um, and I, I try to make, bring them together. And after 12 or 15, I gave up. Um, I, I, it, 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 it just felt too much like, this, you know, just putting two things next to each other. Um, I want to share with you guys, I've, again, editing is not my forte. Well, the drawing is a lot of collage. Yes, they're all collage. Um, so the space it does, yes. Um, it makes them much, you know, 
Yeah, you know, the pictorial space is not more than two or three inches. Another thing is, I've always wanted to paint, you know, Caravaggio is also another one of my favorite painters. Um, he paints very shallow pictures, you know, they're not infinite, they're not deep space. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted is if I could compress the space of my pictures like that and, and, and have figures exist in a space where they couldn't possibly exist or objects exist. Like if you look at the space described in a Caravaggio painting and you take the anatomy of a human being, they can't coexist with one another. You know, the figure is much bigger than the space that surrounds it. Um, I love that tension and I really wanted to bring those that in. These are other, you know, small gouache images. Um, and we're getting close to very close. Yes? Yeah. Keep, yes. We should start with questions and answers. <laughs> you talked about all of your love of painters. Uh huh. And so who's a painter you just like don't get anything? The, I don't what? that I hate who I don't get now you know one of the things that graduate school taught me was to be incredibly stubborn but also very open uh, I have no pay I have no patience whatsoever for 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 paintings that don't fulfill its promise um, you know for for lazy painting um, huh? No, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to be that guy, you know? Uh, I think everybody deserves the opportunity to make what they feel is... Huh? What? Oh, I hate Andy Warhol. I think he's part of the problem. Um, and I know this is being videotaped, so um, I'll stop. You know, the sensibility of Warhol, when, when, when painting starts becoming other, you know, uh, when it starts moving away from the kind of real human premise that I feel uh, is where it is best at. It is not design, it's not magazine. You know, let design and magazines be that. Don't bring it into my court kind of thing. Um, I think a lot of bad painting has been made because of that, because it's been allowed to come into that. Um, yeah, and, and that sounds terribly arrogant, um, and I feel, you know, I think at heart I'm very, very modest. This is a very, very small painting, by the way. Um, and, and, and when I hear myself say that, I feel terrible, but I guess you got me to talk about things that I, I'm, uh, I like my friends, you know, um, I don't look at much painting to tell you the truth. I'm not, you know, one of the advantages of living in Boston is that you don't have the kind of almost implied uh, need, you know, at, at this time in my, in, where I am in my studio, I want to be left alone, uh, you know. Um, I don't look at much contemporary painting. Um, I'm going to see Max Beck, beautiful, very complicated compositions. He must have done studies for them, and I could never find them. And um, then I started to realize that part of what was important, one of the surprising experiences with Goya is every time I see a Goya, no matter how many times I've seen it, it feels like I've seen it for, I'm seeing it for the first time. Um, and then I, I mean, I might just be crazy, but, but I think Goya saw his paintings for the first time also as they were being made. And so I never do drawings for them, you know. Um, these two paintings started to kind of Again, Goya came back to that studio very quickly. Uh, is that in focus? Sort of. Um, this is the family, the royal family. Um, you know, again, a kind of narrative figure painting. If you, I spent a lot of time, I've, I've had the opportunity to go back to Spain many times after that original time. Um, and 
I've always wanted to paint the middle of this picture, you know, just, just the way that he touches from left to right, describing the robes and the figures. You know, the heads are just an excuse to just really move paint around in a way that is so compelling. You know, you can't believe it. And it, the figures are life size. So, so you can imagine, it's about eight, you know, what is that? Nine feet by maybe 12. Uh, and that's also a very strange experience because they, the figures, are, are relate to the scale that we are. It's almost like you feel like you can walk into it. Um, one of the things that I, there's this wonderful moment in the middle of the painting where this figure seems to be hovering. Uh, if you look at all of the other figures, they seem really rooted in the ground. And, and I've always been very much motivated and moved by dualities, you know, weight and weightlessness and, and, and the body and the spirit and, you know, right in the middle of the, the central figure is just floating. Uh, I wanted to paint that. Another one of those paintings that really struck me uh, was this one, the 3rd of May. Uh, this is a painting by you know, um, done after Napoleon invades Spain and um, basically takes over government. Um, it's to commemorate uh, the sacrifice of the people defending Spain against the troops of Napoleon. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've always wanted to do, you know, I've never really wanted to paint allegory. and. This is one of those, you know, very fir first paintings in the history of art that don't deal with certain current events as allegory. You know, this, this event really happened. Uh, that's the royal palace in the background. It's a very specific place outside of Madrid. And it gave me an opportunity to think about painting, you know, out of my own biography. Um, which is something that I also, I forgot to mention, Frida Kahlo. Uh, Frida Kahlo is also, you know, when I was a young artist, she was incredibly, you know, she gave me permission to paint about myself uh, in really uncompromising ways. And, you know, I started making paintings like this. Uh, I was terribly anxious. This was during the, you know, Iraq war here in the United States. Uh, some of the subject of my paintings kind of deals with, a, I don't know whether I wanted to paint directly about it, uh, but I did want to make certain allusions to it. Uh, so in some cases it's compositionally, in some cases it is more directly. Um, and these kind of groupings of figures, of piles of things, you know, started to accumulate in the middle of my painting and it gave me an opportunity to, you know, try to paint through certain passages in ways that then would become, you know, something other than just moving paint around. Um, I do want to say, just as I, as I sort of go more into my own painting, I'm incredibly inarticulate when it comes to describing my own work. It's a real sort of mystery to me. Um, there's a wonderful movie by, um, of Frank Auerbach, who's also a very important figure in my studio at times. And the first thing that he says is that, he hates describing his paintings because what, th what that does is demystify in many ways what should remain mysterious. Uh, I believe that to be a very powerful th aspect of painting. Um, the fact that it is impossible to believe that it could become air and skin and love and the absence of love. Um, I can't put it into words and, 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 and I guess that's why I paint. So forgive me if I'm totally at a loss at times. Uh, so these paintings are all happening at the same time. Some are very, very open. Um, I had set up a still life. By this time, my kids were a little bit older. They might have been four and two years old. I have two boys. 
And I used to bring him to my studio over the weekend so that my wife could, you know, just have a little bit of quiet time. And, you know, they had a little corner and they used to play with the Playmobil figures in Star Wars. And, you know, one Monday when I came into my studio, I realized that their little arrangement, you know, was as inventive and imaginative as anything that I had seen in a long time. Um, and it also gave them access to their imagination. Um, and I stole their idea. So I gathered a bunch of little things from my studio and I started to kind of paint from those. Uh, sometimes you find them very nameable, sometimes you don't. Um, or, you know, one doesn't. Or I, you know, sometimes I do describe them and sometimes I don't. When I don't, uh, I want the things to be a little bit, you know, to, to, for things to be a little bit more open ended. Uh, You know, one of the, the real ambition for these paintings has always been, I guess in my case, I want them to, to, to feel believable. You know, I do believe in that kind of temporary state of disbelief where, you know, when you go to the opera or go to a movie, you start crying, uh, but you know that the actor or actress is gonna be fine, you know, like uh, they're really not, experiencing that which they're depicting. You know, great paintings do that to me. Uh, they put me in that state. So there's a kind of access through believability. So I paint, you know, I, I work really hard to make that happen. Um, I have a little timekeeper here and, and I don't wanna, I have a lot of images. So I'm gonna flip through some very, very quickly. These were some of the drawings that I was describing that I make. I make these little gouache, uh, you know, mixed media, pencil, paper, ink, little things. They're very small, they're about four inches by five inches. And it's normally how I start my day in the studio. I have my little table with my gouache and I just, you know, let my imagination go. Um, I want to show you, I'll show you these very quickly. I think I'm, um, at some point, you know, during this time, there was a confusing sort of, I guess it's an understatement now. Uh, it seemed politically confusing at the time. Uh, and I felt very much like this little figure at times, both in my studio and outside of my studio. Um, so then I, start, I decided to make a painting, you know, a little gouache drawing of it. Uh, and there was some, something about it that I identified with. And I did a number of large paintings based on that little figure as myself in amidst the chaos. Uh, you know, this hovering little straw mannequin. Yeah, I felt like that yesterday. Um, you know, and I did a number of them. I was very fortunate at this time to be um, invited to do a big, you know, big, uh, an exhibition in Mexico. And um, they took everything and they said, you know, let's, it was a very, very nice project. Um, it gave me the opportunity to bring my paintings back to Mexico, which I always felt is the source of them. Um, to see how they looked. You know, I could go to one of the markets that really, you know, inspires some of the decisions that I make uh, and then go look at my painting without much in between and see how they relate. And, and it was terrific, but what it did was empty my studio. You know, I had, I couldn't send them on a stretcher because it was too expensive. So I rolled them up and I, um, this is in 2010. So when I came back from Mexico, I had about 15 large stretcher bars that were empty and, you know, sort of a clean slate. At the end of this time, you know, these paintings, I felt that I could come back into the studio and just make another one. And there was some curiosity in my mind to not do that. Um, I took some students to DC and I saw this painting by Picasso. Picasso was about the, you know, a little bit younger than I. I'm curious to see Cecily Brown's drawing show. Um, I have a kind of, you know, sometimes I really respond to her paintings. The last few that I saw at the MFA, 
were pretty handsome. Okay. Yes? Can we talk a little bit about the, um, the tension between like, a shape mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. and your decision to sometimes kind of turn it into a nameable? Mm -hmm. Yes. And Mm-hmm. 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 Like you mean it just feels like I, I feel like when I look at your work there there's this kind of tug of war going on. Uh-huh. Between those two realms. I mean the short answer is yes there is. Uh, and I think it's about that tension between what I would consider, you know, representation and abstraction, just to name it in really simplistic terms. Um, and but I think what happens is when that thing becomes mutable, mm -hmm. it sort of provides a contact for all the other stuff. Yes. And I feel like that's sort of when the narrative comes into the work. Yes. The narrative is there, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, I guess in, in all of those, you know, painting, painting has that tension in it. Sometimes it leans more one way and more the other way. Um, I, I like to have recognizable things because sometimes I lose myself in non-representation. I mean, I've let some things go very much where you stop seeing nameable things and then, and then they become non-representational paintings, which I have a very hard time identifying with. I miss the storytelling I'm, and I don't see myself in it. And then when they lean the other way, then I miss the, um, then they become just anecdotal, you know? Um, these two images that I'm gonna show you, I took yesterday. This painting was wet and glary when I took the photograph. And on the other side of the wall, I thought that I'd just, you know, share with you, and, and you know, maybe this was gonna be the time for questions and answers. This is a studio shot from last night. Um, I've started a group of new paintings. These are a little bit bigger. They're eight and a half by seven and a half feet. Uh, and then just to, again, give you a sense of the way that I'm going about it. Very small paintings on one side, my sketchbook here, and, and just starting to go for it. Um, in in this, this one I did. Um, and if you, I had to emulate, um, and just to give myself a point of departure. And, you know, to sort of state the obvious, um, given, you know, at some point in my life, I want to deal with Guernica. <laughs> you yeah. know, and this one, I mean, it sounds really pretentious, but, but, um, I'm getting, you know, it, this, when I start in black and white, sometimes it reminds me of that. Um, yeah. You know, what, what I have in my studio and what I paint from are, are a lot of things that I've collected, you know, from Mexico and, 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 and other places. Mexico is very, you know, I surround myself with a lot of things that, that remind me of it and that look from a lot of the craft. Uh, I have a lot of little skeletons and sugar skulls and things like that in my studio that are very particular as to where the, you know, where they came from. Uh, you know, again, in a, in, in a very sort of abbreviated way, I think a lot of the, you know, Venice was a really moving experience. Uh, at times, my paintings felt really, you know, influenced by the, the, the particular light and palette of, of you know, Venetian painting. Um, right now, I, 
You know, one, I, I made these really dark paintings that I didn't have images for, and I think, Stephanie, we may have to stop, no? We need to be out of here at three. Um, so let, let me just, um, uh, uh, you know, I made some really, really dark paintings right at the beginning of um, the Iraq War, and um, I had, I was invited to do a show at Marist College, and Howardina Pindell lives at, in, you know, near Poughkeepsie. She came to my exhibition, and she was this wonderful woman, came over to me, and she said, I have never seen um, any, you know, I've never seen anything more horrific in my life, uh, more, you know, pessimistic and just downright depressing. And I'm like, whoa, what? It caught me by surprise, uh, because I thought they were, you know, they, they, they did have a, hard, a dark palette, but they didn't, um, I didn't see them as that, so I started to 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 try to to not just have aspect you know paintings look that one way. The introduction of color has been a way to to offset that so um, and a lot of that color introduction comes from you know color experiences in Mexico. I mean all you have to do is go to the market and then just you know you're colorblind by the end of the experience. Um, so I don't know how we are doing in terms of time. I, we could keep one more question. And I think we could turn on the lights if you guys don't mind, just so that I could see everybody, because I really can't through the lights. Do any, anybody? I can't, I can't see, so. Well, thank you.